Professor Wang. Professor Wang is right now the acting dean of Cheong Kong Graduate School of Business. If you've heard the name Cheong Kong, you will know that it's one of the companies owned by Li Ka Sheng. Okay, Li Ka Sheng is the Hong Kong superman, the richest man in, in Hong Kong. Right, so he set up Cheong Kong Graduate School of Business. I'll leave uh, Professor Wang to explain more about what Cheong Kong does. I was there in Cheong Kong five years ago as a student and I was really, really impressed because Cheong Kong had quality professors. They were 40 clubs, full-time annual professors. And those professors were not just based in Beijing. They flew in from Columbia, US, just for that class. And that evening flies back to the US. No joke, right? And Cheong Kong has got so many uh, uh, alumni members that are well known. The most well known, you have heard of Jack Ma? He's a graduate of Cheong Kong. Have you heard of Tencent founder? You know, Pony Ma? Graduate of Cheong Kong. Right? Uh, Sinopec, graduate of Cheong Kong. Heard of Lenovo, took over IBM, right? Graduate of Cheong Kong, you name it. All the alumni of Cheong Kong Graduate School of Business, they control 20% of Chinese economy. So if you connect to Cheong Kong, you get influence about 20%. You can connect to this alumni network uh, in in, in China, and that makes it interesting. Professor Wang is a professor of economics and human resource management at CKGSB. He's currently the acting dean as well, and he's the associate dean for academic affairs. Before joining Cheong Kong Graduate School of Business, he taught at Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. He's a research fellow at William Davidson Institute of Transition Economics at the University of Michigan and a senior fellow at the National Center of Economic Research, Tsinghua uh, University. He serves as Vice President of Chinese Economy Society of North America. He has an international MBA 10th anniversary teaching award. He's got a numerous other awards, a PhD from Harvard. So you can't get any better than that. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I present you Professor Wang. Uh, thank you so much, Matos. Uh, you have been introduced without Chiang Kong and myself better than I could have done. Uh, I am sorry about the short service of my visit to Malaysia from my team. And I'm grateful to you and uh, this field and your team for accepting me and putting together a, this group of very distinguished individuals for this morning. I'm very pleased and privileged to be here and sharing this morning with you. Uh, uh, as Bruce said, this is my first visit to Malaysia, and all I have felt is uh, sunny weather, <laughs> uh, all the clean and uh, great environment, and above all, friendship from people I have not met before. I'm very privileged to be yesterday and uh, this morning. I, I trust that this trend will continue in the next few days of my stay here. Uh, my understanding is I'm supposed to speak about the Chinese economy this morning. And uh, I'm a person of very short attention and very short memory, so let me tell you my conclusion first. Basically, the striking lines of my speech this morning is that the Chinese economy is having a very hard time. A very hard time. H-A-R-D. A challenging time. But, for Chinese business people and the international business people, 
this year is probably going to be one of the best years in recent years. Probably the best year in recent years. To start your business there, to go in there, and invest in there, and do business there. Uh, let me explain, okay? Those two lines are my conclusions, okay? The Chinese economy is having a very hard time. This, this 2019 and 2020 are going to be the best years of doing business in China. Let me explain a little bit why I say this is a very hard time for the Chinese economy. You probably have noticed that the Chinese economy has slowed down quite a bit. Over the past 40 years, the economy has grown at an average rate of 10% per annum. To be able to sustain this kind of growth rate is quite spectacular. And it turned the country, turned the economy from nobody and nowhere into one of the big powers. So the, the size of the Chinese economy is about 65 or 70 percent of the U.S. But the projection is the Chinese economy is going to overtake to be the biggest economy in the world within a few years time. I mean, depending on whose forecast you're looking at, some people say that's going to happen in five years, some people say that's going to happen in ten years. But basically that makes no difference. Which, which basically means that before we, before you reach my age, <laughs> that's going to become reality. Right? You have the biggest economy in the world just next to your door. Right? Uh, however, starting a few years ago, the economy is starting to slow down. Especially last year and the year before. It slowed down to 6.6 last year, which would be still, which, which was still one of the fastest, fastest growing economy in the world. But for the Chinese who are used to 10% growth rate, that seemed to be alarming and that seemed to be a very big problem. And worse than that, this year, from government officials and, uh, and, uh, and economists and outside observers, the general belief is that the growth rate of a Chinese economy will further slow down. Now they would feel very happy, the Chinese government policymakers would feel very happy if they can maintain six. 6.5 or 6.6 percent growth rate, right? And they seem to be make, making every effort to make sure the growth rate is at least about about six percent. So that's that's bad news for for people who are used to 10 percent growth rate. Right? On top of that. Trump was launching a historic trade war with China. And he threatened to impose 25% tariff on hundreds of billions of Chinese exports to the U.S. And, he, and as you know, trade with the U.S. is the biggest source of Chinese overall trade balance trade surplus. Right? China now has the biggest foreign exchange reserve of the world. It has something like 300 billion US dollars, 3 trillion US dollars. Right? Something like 3 trillion US dollars 
And most of the surplus is from the U.S. The Chinese have a trade deficit with many other countries. Small amounts of deficits here and there, right? But, but they, they, they mount up to basically nothing. But the surplus with the U.S. is so big, that's what the Chinese count out to, to, to have a sizable foreign exchange stock, reserve stock, and they can feel confident control, controlling foreign exchange rates. But with this, the threat of this trade, trade war on China, the Chinese and the foreign investors as well worry about what's going to happen next. They worry about if the Chinese economy will be further hit and if they, if they are If their, if their trade surplus is going to shrink fast, and the foreign exchange reserve is going to shrink fast. So, in other words, if you read the newspaper around the world, and the reports and the discussions in China, it's all bad news. Mostly, it's all bad news. Right? But then, why, why am I saying 2019 and 2020 would be the best two years for you to do business in China, for Chinese business people and for international investors as well. Why, why am I making this point? That seems to be so unreasonable and contradictory to what's going on in reality. The reason I'm making this claim is that the Chinese government as a secret weapon. And whenever it starts to use this weapon, the economy turns around. And the best time in the economy will come. And what is this secret weapon? And when is the Chinese government going to use it? Well, let me answer the second question first. The Chinese government uses this secret weapon only when the economy is in its worst shape. Right? So keep the weapon in the warehouse. <laughs> in normal times. Not to completely forget it and in good times. Right? Sometimes think about it in normal times. But always remember it in the worst times. Now, what is this secret weapon? <clears throat> the secret weapon is to reduce government intervention and allow more grassroots initiatives. Well, we hear this kind of ideas all over the world, like Bruce was mentioning this just a moment ago, right? And even in the US, we hear the Congress and the politicians mention this idea of encouraging grassroots initiatives. But why is this idea so special in China? This is because China came out of a centralized and a highly planned economy. As in a centralized and a planned economy, grassroots initiatives were completely suppressed. And, and he did everything to government. You need government approval for this or that. And you need government support to get resources for doing this or that. And that was true 40 years ago before China started its economic reform. And that is still very much true nowadays, 40 years into the reform. 